All right. And let me turn this over to you, sir. And then that will be right here. May Coast, you have to accept on your end, please. Um, let me see. Where do I accept? That's the question. Should have popped up with a little box. Did you see it? No, it did not. Huh. Oh, well, your host, it's got you already there. It must not have wanted you to accept. Okay. Well, all right, you are recording, so go for it, sir. Thank you. All right, well, today's lecture um, is called when, uh, when Calls Go Sideways. And really, essentially, it's also uh, the top 10 EMS mistakes. Now, um, it, I gave this lecture last evening to a group not far from here, and I'll have it two more times in the next uh, uh, week. So um, it's very long, so I've decided for this group to break it into two parts. So uh, instead of the top 10 mistakes, tonight we'll go through one through five, and that'll leave plenty of uh, questions. So I'm gonna see if I can get a screen share going. And we'll start here. All right, and um, very good. Start. There we go. All right. So if you can't see it, please let me know, but I, you should have it in front of you. When calls go sideways, the top EMS mistakes. Now, it's, this is divided. <clears throat> there's quite a bit of research on this. And um, if you see the article and want to reference it later, uh, jot it down. Uh, almost everything I talk about will have some connotation or reference to it. And I did quite a bit of research on this. I did a lit, a lit search through the hospital and I put in um, top 10 EMS mistakes and I got about 100 returns back. I whittled that down to uh, the top 10, but some of these are clinical mistakes some of them are life decision mistakes, and some of them are just basic advice. And at this point in your career, I think it'd be very important for you to try and heed these words, especially when it, it talks about uh, two parts. One is a clinical decision that you make uh, that will save someone's life or potentially kill them. And the second is preparing at this stage of your life to think about how you represent uh, the world of EMS. Now, I have about, under my toolage, probably eight EMS agencies. That's a lot of ambulances. Here in Central Oregon, that extends from the California border all the way up to Mount Hood, which is a large geographic area. Some of you could fit multiple states inside just that area itself. But when you go to uh, an EMS agency and become their medical director, usually they give you a jacket. And uh, paramedics love to wear jackets and t-shirts that uh, declare who they are uh, because we're proud of what we do. It's a uniform. But you're also representing your agency, so you have to be very important. Um, so we'll start from there. Uh, so here's the top 10 list is made famous by David Letterman. Of course, we'll do the first uh, five tonight and then next month we'll get to the next five. So we're all striving for perfection. This comes out of the journal of EMS. And when an error occurs, the first thing we have to do is admit that there's an error and not say and take the approach, let's do the best we can. Uh, hiding errors, if we make one, um, and not making the effort to discover an error is not ethical. And that's where I began my talk because you are representing your agency and you're representing medicine in general. So when I say medicine in general, that doesn't mean we're all doctors, but EMS, nurses, PAs, nurse practitioners, allied healthcare, they're all medicine in general including paramedics, EMTs, and basics, no matter where they are. So what we're trying to do is run the same type of sideshow all across that. 
Now we have some colleagues who don't do it as much and that's their problem. I think doing the best we can is not the right way. So error-based improvement is how medical students, interns, residents, attending physicians, they all learn how to better their practice and paramedics should be the same. So here are the top 10. You can look at the list now and we'll go through one through five. Uh, number one, practical career errors. Two, medication errors. Three, misplaced endotracheal tubes. Four, inappropriate AMA refusals. And five is not participating in CQI. That's quality improvement. And uh, I'll show you why that's important because we'll refer to that multiple times this evening. So these are in no particular order. So don't say, oh, the number one mistake is. That's not correct. These are in no particular order. So number one mistake is practical career errors. That's the part that you have to think about ahead of time. That's the parent in all of us saying you need to make sure you're doing the right thing. And here is that list. This comes from a really interesting uh, article written in EMS World top 10 things that get EMS providers in trouble. Number one would be vehicle and roadway operations. These are the things that we do that you're gonna take in your safety classes that you'll learn during your driving and scene management where you have to be careful. Uh, everyone likes to go lights and sirens because that gets the patient to the hospital the quickest. However, that's not necessary in every uh, instance. There are articles written on how people were going lights and sirens and they've run red lights because they have the ability to and then they wind up getting broadsided and kill not only their patient but kill themselves. That's part of vehicle operations. Roadway operations are scene safety, making sure that your scene is appropriately taken care of. About 15 years ago, a very good friend of mine, a paramedic from uh, Madras, Oregon, uh, was on a scene on New Year's Day and they were setting up the scene when he was struck and killed by a car. It happens. It was a terrible thing for our community. It was a great grieving uh, time for our community. And I think of Bob every time I drive past that area of the highway because there's a small cross there dedicating that area to him. Number three, integrity issues. That's what I was talking about when I referred to uh, wearing your uniform proudly. I um, have several uniforms from several agencies and I like to wear them uh, because it means I'm representing that particular uh, EMS agency. One time I went to meet one of the shift commanders uh, for an after work beer and I walked in and I was wearing my jacket. And he politely leaned forward to me and said, Matt, I know you like your jacket, but you're in uniform. Please take it off. I had never thought of that. Because you can't be in a bar as a paramedic with your uniform and having a drink. That just doesn't look good. Now, I would never drink on duty. Neither would you. However, you have to think about that. If you're wearing a East Indiana EMS and you're at a wrestling match throwing beer, people aren't going to think much of you. Report writing. I'm going to talk about this in um, one of our top 10 about where EMS gets in trouble, but your report has to be perfect all the time. We all strive for perfection, but we'll talk about specifics in that uh, section of the lecture. Health and fitness. I'll be first to tell you that this is very, very important because when we work too hard and paramedics firefighters all work very hard, including physicians and nighttime nurses, etc. When we work that hard, we tax our bodies because we work long hours under high stress, we wear our immune systems down, and we don't get enough rest. So it's very important for each of us to get uh, take care of our health, make sure we're getting enough sleep. I don't want to sound like your mother, but that's correct. You know, if my watch can tell me, uh, my watch, my eye watch, 
uh, now tells me when it's time to go to bed. I try and listen to it. Sometimes I ignore it, but you have to get your uh, eight hours of sleep if you can, if that's what your body needs, and you have to make sure you're fit and getting exercise. When you don't, when you work 48 hours in a row, which a lot of you will wind up doing because that gives you three or four days off, you're going to have a lot of recovery time. It's easy when you're young, harder when you're older. Personal protective equipment. I can't express enough how important this is. Wear your eye gear, wear your mask if it's appropriate, or put a mask on the patient if they're coughing. If you respond to a sickly uh, 86-year-old uh, gentleman who's from a Native American uh, ranch, or uh, if you're dealing with a 26-year-old immigrant from Mexico or from Africa, they might have tuberculosis. You don't want to expose yourself or your others to that, so make sure you wear protective gear or put it on them. And that includes gloves. It drives me crazy when I work in the emergency department and I see a nurse put on a glove and then cut off a finger so that she can feel the vein. I kind of say, I look over and I say, you know, if you got blood on you right now, you'd be a goner. You could get hepatitis, hep C, hep B, HIV. So wear your personal protective equipment. Off-duty behavior. We talked about that a little bit in integrity issues. And that means that you are representing your community. You're representing medicine in general. So you had better make sure that your behavior is within the confines. And I'm sure each of you, when you get a job, will sign a contract. And in your contract, there will be discretion as to what to do and what not to do. Over the years of my medical direction, I've had to take care of some paramedics who had drinking problems or drug problems or anger issues. And most of the time we worked through them. Sometimes those paramedics had to be dismissed and that's not good for anybody. Decision making. We're gonna talk about decision making and the best way to take care of decision making is to follow your protocols. We all try and make decisions. We make, sometimes we make the right decisions, sometimes we make the wrong decisions, but just make sure you have a good decision making process. And that decision making is based on one, your education, two, your gut, because gut sometimes is very important. And three, make sure you're not deviating from your protocols. Mental health issues, we already alluded to a little bit. Uh, night shift workers, paramedics, physicians, nurses, all have higher mental health problems than the general public because we deal with so much stress. How we react to that stress is very, very important. And end of career, end of life planning, uh, I can't express enough at this time. If you haven't met with a life insurance salesman, a disability insurance salesman, they're usually the same, and a health insurance person, make sure that you have done that. That is the most important aspect of taking care of yourself and your family. If you get sick, you get hurt on the job, you're gonna need disability insurance. Sometimes your job will provide that for you, but it's better to have coverage outside of your job as well. End of life planning means retirement. If you haven't done it already, go find a, uh, a planner in the local area. Best to ask somebody for a referral because these are the people that are gonna help set up your uh, retirement. All right, so I'm gonna move on from that. Number two. Medication errors. This is a biggie. Uh, medication errors happen fairly frequently in all of medicine. Uh, if you look at the word iatrogenic, iatrogenic is a big fancy word that you're going to hear during your career, but iatrogenic means we cause the problem. For example, you intubate the esophagus, somebody has 
anoxia because you don't intubate correctly. They wind up with brain damage. That is an iatrogenic error. Another error might be giving uh, someone the wrong medication and it causes side effects and we didn't carefully listen to that person and find out. So medication errors are a big one. Medication errors are defined as any preventable error involving medication that may cause injury or harm to the patient, wrong medication, wrong dose. And there's a simple solution to that by remembering the five rights. Right patient, that's easy. Most of the time you're gonna be treating one patient at a time, but you might be treating in an MCI two or three or multiple patients. So your partner might say, the driver needs Zofran and you go to the passenger and you give Zofran to the passenger who might have a Zofran allergy. Pretty rare, but it's possible. So make sure you have the right patient. Make sure you have the right medication. In the emergency department, we have a read back. You should have your partner read back to you. So when I say, I want this person a verbal order to get one milligram of epinephrine, the nurse turns to me and says, did you say one milligram of epinephrine? I said, yes, one milligram of epinephrine. She pulls out one milligram of epinephrine. She holds it in front of everybody. She says, give him one milligram of epinephrine now. And then you continue the code or, or whatever you're doing. So write medication, read back and feedback. When I even inject a small amount of lidocaine, and I have on sterile gloves, and I draw the medicine out of the bottle if I'm holding a sterile environment, the nurse holds it, she looks at it and she goes, lidocaine 1% without epinephrine. And I say, check, lidocaine without epinephrine. You should be doing the same. Anytime, because you're gonna be handing your partner, if you're drawing up and he's running the scene, you're gonna be handing your partner the medication and he's depending on you to give him the right medication. So check and recheck. Right dose, we'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about pediatrics, but make sure you're giving the correct dose based on weight or whatever your protocol says. So very often, you can't remember, is this one milligram I give or 10 milligrams? Thankfully, we have most of the time our uh, syringes only contain one dose of the correct dose, but sometimes you might have a multi-dose vial and you wanna make sure you don't give the wrong dose. Right indication. Why am I giving this medication? Am I giving amiodarone in a code because I'm trying to treat ventricular tachycardia? That's a good indication. Am I giving epinephrine to treat ventricular tachycardia? No, that's not right. That's a bad indication. So make sure you have the right indication. And right route. Am I giving this by mouth? Am I giving it IV? Am I giving it IM? And in parentheses is write documentation. Write everything down. Uh, several, uh, there's a study that went back and looked at multiple EMS agencies pulled their records and they looked at errors. The good news is that errors in medication for EMS are going down. So all reported errors in this study involved uh, wrong drug dosages. Uh, pediatric dosing errors decreased from 60% to 28% of the reported errors over the time the study was taken. Uh, none of the pediatric errors involved epinephrine and pediatric EMS uh, EMS incidents were about 8% of all that were reported. This uh, slide, we'll talk a little bit when we talk about CQI, but when you talk to your medical director, you should also be talking about QI, QI, QA, QI, or continuous quality improvement. QA stands for quality assurance. QI stands for quality improvement. 
and you should have CQI as it relates to medications and medication errors. Uh, you should have a tool to continue to evaluate the care, and it should be a dynamic process, meaning if things don't work correctly, they change along the way. This is a nice study from pre-hospital emergency medicine in 2012, and it talked about medication dosing errors in pediatric patients treated by EMS. And it studied eight different agencies in Michigan. Altogether, there are about 5,547 children. Of those, 230 or 4.1% received medications and had a documented weight or BL tape. Now, BL tape is your Braslow tape. Uh, we'll talk about that in a couple minutes, but the Braslow tape is a simple tape system where you lay it next to the child and you figure out if he's in the red zone, green zone, yellow zone. You turn to your box and in that box immediately you'll have dosages for that child. That's the Braslow system. Uh, there are different systems. Uh, I showed was shown one uh, last night by an agency which is a small wheel. It's a simple wheel <clears throat> and it's based on the weight of the child. But what you actually have to have is an accurate weight on the child. Sometimes it's based on age and, and, a, and the age of a patient is an approximate weight. But I think the more you get into things like the Braslow tape and the hand heavy system, I think that's a little bit better. Um, in this study, 360 medications were given. Uh, medication error was defined as uh, greater than 20% deviation from the weight appropriate dose as used by the Braslow tape that we just mentioned. What they found in the study was quite amazing. Medication errors occurred in almost 34% of the children who were treated. Epinephrine had the highest percentage of incorrect dosages. Medications delivered to children in the pre-hospital setting by paramedics were frequently outside the proper range when compared to documented patient weights. What that means is we're not very good at guessing something's weight. You look and say, that child weighs 40 pounds, you put them on a scale and they only weigh 30 pounds. Uh, you know, I once had a surgeon say to me, I asked him how low of a um, child are you comfortable taking out the appendix of? And he said, well, as long as it's the size of a large salmon. Now that's a really relative thing. For me, a large salmon is about, as far as the fish I've ever caught, you know, 15, 16 inches, but for most people, they're talking 48 inches or something like that. So you have to make sure you're working on the same scale. So we're not very good at judging weight. Uh, so when we compare documented patient weights, EMS systems sh uh, should develop strategies to reduce pediatric medication dosing errors. Uh, final points, always double check the drug and the dose. Uh, put narcotics in a separate container, tamper resistant plastic bags with serial numbers if possible. Uh, there's no need to be in a hurry to give a patient the wrong medication. So essentially, we all want to give things expediently, but don't go so quickly that you make a mistake. For kids, use the Braslow tape system. Uh, PEDS code card or a wheel, if that's what you use, or the hand heavy card system. Uh, that's a different system where people use fingers and counting on the hand. Some paramedics like it. I personally don't like it. I prefer the Braslow tape. And remember, mistakes happen, and when they do, we should report them immediately because we don't want to make the same mistake twice. Number three. misplaced endotracheal tubes. This is a biggie. If you were in my agency or in my emergency department where I work and have been medical director, you would be required to take a difficult airway course. 
I teach this course every two years. You're going to see them anywhere you go. You're going to see them advertised. And essentially, they are to familiarize you with every tool in the box. Hey, Johnny. Yo. Do you want a peanut? Of course I do. This is an almond, for future reference. Is it flavored? I don't know. It's found in Frank's count. <laughs> Johnny, one of these days you're going to start asking where things come from. I mean, who knows what Frank did on that almond? I find the weirdest stuff in that cage. You okay? You need the Heimlich? Johnny, I don't know the Heimlich. Hold it. I'm Googling it. Sorry, dude. Gotta spell it right. Okay, hold it, hold it. Think I'm on to something here. Got it, got it, this is it. Oh no, 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 Have you, I'm not doing this. I, Johnny, I'm sorry, man. Your friendship means a lot to me and everything, but if you saw what I am seeing here, you would totally side with me on this one. This is ridiculous. Johnny. It's always on a Saturday. It's always on a Saturday. Okay. All right. So hopefully that didn't offend anybody. All right. Learn to use every tool in the box. So I'm going to go over several different tools here. Most of your agencies have them. If they don't, they should. And in the emergency department, we have probably as many plus about five more. So when I teach my airway course, I want folks to know that number one, they have a toolbox. And number two, sometimes you need a crescent wrench. Sometimes when a crescent wrench doesn't work, you're going to have to use a pair of pliers. So how do you do that in the EMS world and airway? What is a difficult airway first off? First off and foremost, a difficult airway is the airway that you don't have at present time, but you needed two minutes ago. Keep in mind that every time that you manage an airway, it has the potential to become a difficult airway. <clears throat> there are no easy intubations or airway management. By understanding not only your primary, but your secondary and tertiary plans, to manage a patient's airway, you'll be prepared for the worst. I took out several slides about basic airway management uh, for the sake of time, but essentially remember you always start with the basics like your chin lift, jaw thrust, bag valve mask, OPA or NPA if necessary, and those are the things that you're gonna use to maintain a patient's respirations until you get their airway established. This is a quick mnemonic. And I, you know, when I was a student, uh, I love mnemonics. We still use it in medicine. And this is very, very important. The lemon mnemonic for airway management. <clears throat> Number one, look at the anatomy. Are you dealing with an obese patient, a pregnant patient, something wrong with their tongue? So you have to look in the airway, not only hopefully before you decide to intubate somebody, when we come up on a scene in EMS, we usually don't have the luxury of determining if we're going to intubate. However, we often have a couple of seconds to a minute to decide if we're going to intubate or if our treatments are not improving. You have to look at the anatomy. You have to see what you're dealing with. Uh, the 332 rule under E, evaluate. I'll go over that in a, in a minute. Malin Petty score. What's that mean? I'll show you what that means. Obstruction or teeth or swelling. I'll talk about that. And neck immobility. Are you going to be able to move the neck? Can you intubate somebody properly if their neck is immobile? First off is look. 
You want to see what's going on. Have the patient open their mouth. You want to know if they've got a, view, a, a ring in their uvula or their tongue. If they're a snaggle tooth, like this guy on the right, you want to know that as well. Because when you're done, you want to know if he has the same amount of teeth before the procedure and after the procedure. Because somebody like this very often will knock that tooth out while we're intubating and that tooth goes where? It goes directly into the trachea is where it goes. So look, I once reviewed a case for paramedics. Uh, they, I was asked by a group of lawyers to look at a case to see if they were defending the paramedics and they asked me, what do you think of the treatment? They came upon a scene, the patient who had asthma, they decided to intubate the patient. They started an IV and the patient could not communicate well because they were having a bad asthma attack and they gave succinylcholine in order to intubate and the patient was very rigid and when they finally looked in the mouth, they found that the patient had a fractured jaw and their jaw had been wired shut. If they had done look before, they would not have uh, intubated the patient, obviously. Or before they gave the succinylcholine, they would have cut the uh, braces off. In that particular case, I told the lawyers, you better just write the check because there's no defending that one. All right, E, evaluate. 332 rule. Ask the patient if they can to put three fingers like a Boy Scout sign, make a Boy Scout sign, and can they put their three fingers in the mouth? Try it yourself while I'm talking. If you can hold up your fingers and put three fingers in the mouth, and you can fit them in the mouth right directly under your incisors, the chances are that your jaw mobility will be okay and you won't have a difficult airway. If you don't have that and they still need a tube, just be prepared because if they can only fit two fingers in, you may need to change the way you intubate them or you better have some type of backup. We'll talk about backup. The second part of the 332 rule is if you put your finger on your chin and can you put three fingers on your chin and is it still above your hyoid bone? So that's the second three, and then you take one finger away and you turn your finger down, and can you get two fingers above the larynx? So three, three, two, and if you do the three, three, two rule and pass, then the chances are good that you'll be able to open that mouth enough to get in an intubation tube. Mellon Petty score. Mellon Petty score comes in four grades. One and two are relatively easy intubations. Grade three and four are very difficult. You don't, I won't read the entire slide, but essentially if you look at it, the top two are the easier. And number three, if you only see half the uvula, um, it's gonna be moderate difficulty. And if you don't see any of the uvula or any black, it could be class four, severe difficulty. Most of the time when you look at kids, they look like a class four. You ask them to stick their tongue out, you can't see anything. That's why they have to use a tongue depressor. You know, when the doctor says, say, ah. But very often when patients open their mouth, you can see the back of their soft palate, their uvula, the tonsillar pillars. We're all hoping for class one or two, class three or four, be prepared for a possible difficult airway. Observe, here's uh, Snaggletooth again. Observe any obstructions. Is there swelling? Is there infection? This ungen uh, unfortunate gentleman has bad gingivitis. He's got sores in his mouth. He might have a swollen tongue from angioedema. He might have infections in the back of the throat. All of these things you have to look at before you intubate. And lastly is neck mobility. There is a safe way to intubate somebody uh, in a neck immobilizer, and that's having somebody else perform inline cervical traction. You can then remove the collar 
And as you remove the collar, you can very slightly extend and intubate the patient. Your partner, if you're at the head, your partner may have to hold inline stability from the chest level in front. Uh, you can take a collar off to intubate. Just keep in mind that you're not cranking back like you would a normal patient. CPAP stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. Many of your agencies will have CPAP machines like this one. It comes in a system, there are different sizes, and these are the people who are maybe bad COPDers who are having air hunger and maybe bad congestive heart failure patients who are having air hunger and you think you might need to intubate them. Their work of breathing is really high and they're looking like they're going to need to be intubated anytime soon, but you can rescue yourself with a CPAP machine. The PAP stands for positive airway pressure. And what this little machine does here in the lower right hand corner is it provides positive pressure so that the airways are forced open. You can see again in this right lower corner here, they come in different sizes from kids to women to adult men or larger patients and they work well. So say you've got a bad COPD or or a bad congestive heart failure patient, and you're giving some Lasix, maybe you're giving a little bit of nitroglycerin under the tongue if they're CHF, and you think that you're gonna uh, try and get them to the hospital, but you wanna make sure that uh, they don't need intubation first, try CPAP, and CPAP can very often spare you that time until you get them to the hospital to a more controlled environment. No one says you have to be a hero and intubate everybody. That's one of the other aspects of mistakes with missed endotracheal tubes. Just because you can do a procedure doesn't mean you should be doing a procedure. So uh, the port vent system is very uh, popular. Most agencies carry these. Here's a picture of a paramedic who's giving a gentleman most likely with COPD uh, breathing treatment and it helps avoid intubation. So that's a rescue. Now we're gonna talk about a few rescue airways. First and foremost, down in the lower left-hand corner here is your bag valve mask. That will buy you time. If you can get a full five minutes of 100% oxygen on a bag valve delivered mask before you intubate, that's the best and I'll tell you why in a few minutes. Sometimes we don't have the luxury. If our patient's apneic, we don't have that five minutes. They need a tube now. But if you have a breathing person and you think that you can help them, if you can give them a full five minutes of oxygen, that's best. The upper left is an eye gel. I'll talk about that in a minute. The King tube is one of many, and LMA is one of many other rescue devices. Suffice it to say that I don't own stock in any of these, so I don't care what rescue tube device you use. This is relatively new to the box, the eye gel. The eye gel is kind of a combination of an LMA, which I'll talk about in a minute, and a king tube. They're a little bit different shaped. They mold a little bit better to the back of the throat they are a rescue device, so they're not in the trachea. They're above the trachea, and they work relatively well. They come in different sizes based on the size of the patient and how much they weigh, and they work a whole lot like an LMA and a king tube combined. The king tube, of course, is kind of the standard. It's an non-intubating tube that has two uh, different balloons. The distal balloon down here, distal meaning furthest away, uh, goes in the esophagus and you inflate it. The upper balloon is in the mouth and you inflate that. And what's nice about it is uh, you guys are young, but old folks like me remember something called a combi tube. And a combi tube was 
kind of similar, but it had two different airway de uh, inflation devices depending on where you were. And sometimes you didn't know if you were in the esophagus, you didn't know if you were in the trachea, and sometimes you didn't know which one to blow up. This is nice because you only blow up once. When you blow it up, it goes into the back of the throat. This goes into the back of the throat. The distal aspect goes into the esophagus, hopefully protecting some of the esophagus, and the air comes out right here. These are also based on size and weight, and some they go down to children, and they go up to obese patients as well. Each one will have the correct amount of syringe air that goes with them. So most of the time they come together as a kit and they tell you uh, exactly how much air to put in them. The LMA or laryngeal mask airway. If you were to go for a knee operation in your local hospital and you're gonna do it under light sedation, your anesthesiologist would most likely use this LMA. The LMA device <clears throat> is also a rescue device and it goes and it's designed to go into the upper esophagus. You can see here, it kind of brings the uh, uh, trachea forward and then the air goes passively through here and into the lungs. It is a rescue device. It doesn't work well for those patients who have COPD or high pressure, people who are gonna need a high amount of pressure to get into the lungs, it doesn't work that well. <clears throat> and there is always a risk with all of these airways. Keep in mind this airway, this airway, and that airway. There is always a risk of causing a patient to vomit because you're sticking it into the esophagus here. You can trigger, and your the back of the throat, they could have a gag reflex. Uh, so you have to be aware of uh, whether or not you're going to give somebody like succinylcholine or something like that and block that response. <clears throat> you can't do this on an awake patient. An Eschmann catheter is kind of a cheat sheet for um, uh, looking at the trachea. It's a nice tube. They come in <clears throat> mostly disposables. I'll show you in a minute. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the disposables are blue. The standard ones that can be reused are orange or yellow. And <clears throat> the idea here is to intubate the patient as best you can. And right down here, you see there's a little hook on the Eschmann catheter. As you intubate the patient, and this is usually used in an airway where you don't have a good view of the cords, but you have an adequate view of the uh, uh, vollecula here <clears throat> and an adequate view of the epiglottis. And you're able to sneak it under the epiglottis, but you can't see the cords. So when you sneak this past the epiglottis and into the trachea, this little hook here, like a hockey stick here on the lower right, will actually hit up against these trachea and you'll feel it with your fingers. So it's a way to kind of blindly insert a nasotracheal tube with a guide that's helping you. So here's how you can set it up. So as I said, the disposable ones, these are on the in slide number one. These are all uh, simple uh, Eschmann type of catheters, this one and this one. This is from a glide scope and these are your two endotracheal tubes. But here's the trick of using an Eschmann catheter with an endotracheal tube. And you set it up like this. You hold it in your dominant hand, whether you're left-handed or right hand. You put the Eschmann catheter through your tracheal tube until it comes out the end. You can uh, hook it in there and hold it there while you're doing so. Very often you need a partner to help you. So once you get this distal end into the trachea and you feel the little clicks in the trachea, then you can 
unhook this apparatus right here. And as you hold tension on the tube, your partner holds here and you can help slide the tube like a, what's called a selic maneuver. And you slide the tube over the Eschmann catheter and it follows the Eschmann catheter into the trachea. So that's another way to get by. All right, <clears throat> next one is video assisted intubation. Everyone knows that uh, we talk about the old days, like a horse and buggy, and there was an entire industry that went down, meaning the buggy industry <clears throat> or the uh, uh, whip industry when people were drawing horse-drawn carriages. I think the same will happen with the standard laryngoscope eventually. Here's the standard laryngoscope in this picture. Uh, I trained with this. There's a Miller and a Mac. This isn't an airway course, so we're not gonna spend a lot of time on that. But <clears throat> I probably haven't used a Miller and a Mac, sorry, in the last uh, seven to 10 years because I use a GlideScope that's up here. And I think most agencies will have either uh, of these two video laryngoscopes or they might have a GlideScope. They give you the picture that you see in the lower right-hand corner. That's a perfect picture. If anyone's ever intubated with uh, in the field before, you almost never get this picture in the lower right-hand corner when you're using a standard laryngoscope in an emergency situation. It's very difficult, but you almost always get it with a video assisted intubation. So when you do your skills, you're gonna to have to learn to use video assisted intubation. We'll talk a little bit about rapid sequence intubation. <clears throat> rapid sequence intubation is when you give uh, a series of medications in order to uh, make a patient unconscious so that their jaw relaxes. Generally in RSI, we pre-treat them with a little lidocaine. We give them some Versed or some Etomidate to make them unconscious. And then we give them succinylcholine to paralyze the muscles so that we can get the tube in. If you remember your very first slide, the look, evaluate slide, Malampetti slide, you want that jaw open as much as possible. So the six P's of rapid sequence intubation are preparation, getting everything ready before you start, make sure in your preparation that you not only have your primary airway, you have your secondary rescue airway available, and you know where your third airway might be. And I'll talk about the third airway in just a minute. So that's preparation. Preparation also is sitting down like today, reading through this and getting to know all of your anatomy. Pre-oxygenation, as much as possible, 100% oxygen through a high flow mask or some form of a mask, whether it's a bag valve or a standard mask, if you can do five minutes, that's the best. Pre-treatment, that's your medication, such as your lidocaine, if they have a head injury. Lidocaine also works well to blunt the response that you give when you put a tube in somebody's throat. Lidocaine is the same lidocaine that you give when you go to the dentist or if you get stitches. It's the same medication that you give in a code uh, the only difference between a code and lidocaine and the uh, lidocaine that we give uh, in a wound is uh, the one in the code doesn't have preservatives. And that's what we use for pretreatment. We might give some midazolam, or we may give some fentanyl, or we may give some atomidate, <clears throat> or whatever you care to give for pretreatment, whatever your local protocols call for. Paralysis with induction and protection, that's when you give your succinylcholine. Placement of the tube and post-intubation management, which I'll talk about in just a few minutes. 
make sure you've got the tube in the right place. This is a graph that shows what happens uh, with giving oxygen. Now, if I were to pre-oxygenate each one of you, assuming that you're healthy and assuming that you don't have any good medical problems, if I were to pre-oxygenate you with 100% oxygen for five minutes and then inject you with 100 milligrams of succinylcholine, that would stop your respiration entirely. But if you pre-oxygenate properly, this curve here on the right, the normal patient, succinylcholine wears off in about five to six minutes. So you can see that your blood will remain oxygenated out to that five or six minutes in the 90 to 100% range, and then it quickly, quickly falls off. The more obese you are on the left-hand side, the quicker you fall off. Normal children uh, here in the purple fall off in between, and a moderately ill person will fall off here. So most adults fall off the curve somewhere between four minutes and nine minutes. So that's why we give succinylcholine, because when it wears off, if we don't get a tube in, we can use our other rescue methods. <clears throat> this is what our third type of rescue method. Remember we talked about king tubes and eye gels or LMAs, and then getting the tube in is the number one rescue method. But cricothyroidotomy is our third type. There are different kits, different types. We use a quick trach in our ER. We also have a, a milker in our ER. We have two different types. Here's the cricothyroid membrane. You can always maintain an airway with that. Afterwards, uh, the 6P is what to do afterwards. You should have a CO2 detector that lets you know that you're in the right place. If you're in the wrong place, you're not going to you're going to get this brown area if you intubate somebody in the esophagus or during a code people in the code they're not respiring because their heart's not moving and their lungs aren't moving so they're going to be in that brown area but if you intubate the uh, trachea as needed this will go quickly from yellow to purple and then back again these will last about 30 minutes the easy caps and then we follow that up with end tidal CO2. End tidal CO2 is the gold standard. You should have it on all your rigs, all your machines should have it as well. Number four, we're gonna move uh, along quickly for four and five. Inappropriate AMA refusals. You have to determine whether or not first off is a patient competent? Are they oriented to person, place, and time? Is their judgment correct? Do they have normal reasoning capability and capacity? And do they understand the potential or significant health condition if they refuse your care? Very often you'll respond to a code, let's say it's an asthmatic. You give them a breathing treatment and you want to transport them to the hospital and they, want to, they don't want to go. That will happen. Or it might be a diabetic who was hypoglycemic and you correct them. But you determine in your best judgment that maybe you should go to the hospital to get checked because if it's an overdose of a long acting insulin, their blood sugar is gonna go down again. You wanna transport them to the hospital and they say, no, I don't wanna go against medical advice. You have to make sure that they're competent. Adult patient refusals. Any adult can refuse transport or treatment in part or whole if they are determined to be competent and alert. You know, we're not arresting people. Uh, where risks and the benefits of the treatment have been explained to the patient, and the patient has a reasonable follow-up plan. No, I took a short-acting insulin, I'm okay, I miss, I didn't eat my lunch, I'll be fine, I'm gonna go see my doctor tomorrow. Okay, you can sign an AMA form. Police holds can be used if a police officer believes that the patient is a danger to himself or others and in need of immediate care and custody. Uh, this is kind of a sticky area because sometimes uh, police will call you to transport a patient, but if the officer believes that they are harmed to themselves or others and you support the officer, 
that can be used. Uh, if they want to put them in the rig in handcuffs, that's not a great idea because uh, we would prefer another method or if you have a key because it's hard to intubate a patient with their uh, hands tied behind their back. A minor is defined as a person uh, who is 18 or under and unmarried and does not have a decree of emancipation. This is important, underline unmarried and uh, also underline decree of emancipation because you might have a 16 year old who uh, has three children and she's emancipated. So they can make their own decisions. Uh, utilize implied consent. That means it'd be reasonable that this person would want me to treat them for injuries and illnesses that present immediate life-threatening life and limb. Sometimes you might have to get police involved to help you. A reasonable attempt should be made in life and non-life-threatening conditions to contact a parent. And if any adult is refusing transport treatment for a child with a life limb threatening injury, contact the police department and treat under implied consent. Does that mean go against uh, patients and parents' wishes? Well, the court will support you and say yes. If somebody refuses for religious reasons or something like that, get police involved and you're gonna to have to use implied consent. Document, document, document. If you can't do that, ask medical control for help, obtain signatures and a witness. Uh, you might have somebody else sign the chart in addition to yourself and the refusal form. You do have a duty to terrify meaning you have the duty to make them, if in your judgment, you think that a patient needs to go to the hospital and they're refusing, they have that right, but you have the duty to terrify. It's just as important as the forms you might fill out. Refusing a patient uh, situation is more legally defensible when it's knowing and informed. So, Mrs. Smith, do you realize that if you don't go to the hospital, your COPD could get worse, you might die, and we might not get to you? Do you understand that? Turn to the spouse if they're there. Do you understand that your husband or wife is refusing treatment, and they might die if we leave? It's possible that they could have brain damage or something. You have a duty to terrify the patient. Uh, you have to talk about the risks of non-treatment and non-transport, the benefits of treatment and transport, and options and alternatives. You can always call us again. Yes, you've signed, but you can always call us again. We'll be here if you need us. How often patients do that? Yeah. When you get out in the real world, you'll find an EMS, that's a difficult thing to say, but you have to. Uh, your um, health record, I said, document, document, document. You should have a refusal checklist and attach that refusal checklist and advice sheet to your chart. Utilize implied consent for patients who are not alert. You know, if you have a drunk patient who says, I'm not going to that hospital, they killed my wife or nearly killed my wife. Well, if they're intoxicated, they're not alert and oriented times four, do the best you can. In rare cases, you're gonna to have to contact medical control or police for enforcement. You shouldn't use physical or chemical restraints as punishment. Um, sometimes we have to do it to protect the patient. It's not to be used on patients specifically refusing treatment unless they are placed under police hold or being treated under implied consent. However, that doesn't mean that we can't give a violent patient who's refusing treatment to protect ourselves a medication that would sedate them and any reasonable person would see that this person is dangerous. If they're dangerous to me, they're probably dangerous to you and therefore we can use sedating medication. This is what a checklist looks like. Every agency you work for will have their own, but you can see you're gonna to have to check every box and make sure everything's done. On the bottom is your signature John Q. Public, and I would have a second underneath witness, somebody else who signs it. And we're coming to the end, number five. 
non-participation in CQI, continuous quality improvement. Everybody who's online gets a gold star for today because they are participating in some type of continuous quality improvement. Now, when I sit down with my paramedic agencies and give them lectures or when I'm giving you lectures, that's great, you learn. But you're, gonna have to, you're not gonna have your medical director every day of the week, so you're gonna have to rely on your shift commander and your chief to help you through this process. You should review runs every day as a group. You should go over a run every time you come back. Every time you finish a run, you could say, how did that run go? Could we do anything better? Did we do everything correctly? You should be professional and it should be a constructive process. CQI programs help prevent problems by evaluating day-to-day -day operations. You know, every time I give that medication, half of it squirts out. Well, that's because you didn't twist it enough or that we need to look for a better syringe to fit that IV. Things like that are identified. Look for ways to eliminate human error. We've seen the slide before, improving system quality. We talked about it for uh, drugs. The same goes for your system. It's a dynamic process, continually going. Be careful when handling patient handoffs. That means uh, generally that is in the emergency department. Make sure you give a complete history. Uh, in the future, uh, we'll talk about medical legal problems with charts and how to fix those. Uh, three main sources of errors are rules-based fa failure, where you uh, break the rules, knowledge-based failure, where you just didn't know how to treat something, or skills-based failure, where you didn't have the skills necessary, such as intubation. If you don't know how to intubate, you shouldn't be expected to intubate. It all depends on your level of training. Agencies need clear protocols. Those are provided by your medical director. Ask yourself, why am I doing this? Why am I intubating the patient? Maybe they don't need to be intubated. Maybe they're gonna do okay with high flow oxygen and bag valve mask. Just because we can do something doesn't mean we have to do. Use cheat sheets when available and be conscious of your protocols. All right, that's the end. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop sharing my laptop and I'll take questions as they appear. Hey, Dr. Eschelbach. We were having a little discussion on the side here about the alcohol uh, impaired patient and injuries and refusals. And I was explaining to them that sometimes uh, another term that um, some of the attorneys I know use that are paramedics uh, besides confidence is mental capacity. And so, you know, it comes into, do they have the mental capacity to understand what you're talking to them about and the mental capacity to refuse transport. And then there's a matter of how do you establish that mental capacity and document it so that you're protected. I think that's where Adrian was going with that. So if you've got something you wanna to add to that. No, I think that's correct. Um, the, if someone is intoxicated, they put it this way. Everything is based on law when it comes to this in EMS. You can't operate a vehicle if you're intoxicated. You get pulled over and you get a Dewey or a DUI, driving under the influence. If you can't operate a vehicle by law, you can't really make a decision for your own health care by law. So if they don't have the capacity to make that decision, then they really can't, of sound mind and body, do this. Now there are gray zones. If you're talking about somebody who has a cut and they're refusing, that's a little bit different. You know, if you're talking about somebody who has an open fracture and they have loss of life or limb as a consequence, then I would probably call the PD. You can have them arrested and then the police officer can bring them in and escort them. So use uh, a lot of times especially in those situations, you're gonna call EMS for backup, I mean for a police for backup to begin with, to make sure the scene is secure. 
That's the very first thing we talked about in our first slide. So C security is also very important. All right, let's see, any other questions here? Oh, Adrian, did that adequately answer your question? You saying, okay, that makes sense. Yes, okay, that's it. Do you have any questions for Dr. Eschelbach? That was a good question, Adrian. And I do recommend you go online, get, Google it. Type in mental capacity assessment, mental capacity exam, EMS. There's some good articles out there uh, about how to assess mental capacity. And I want to say that one of our editor, who's uh, one of our prior full-time instructors, uh, William E. Gandy, G-A-N-D-Y, has written one or two out there. He's an attorney paramedic, and I think there's some floating on the net that you can really find that talks about how to best establish someone's mental capacity that may be impaired, because you're right, if you refuse them, and then they're impaired and didn't refuse, and I have seen this happen, then it could lead not only to negative patient outcome, but you uh, ending up uh, your career changes now going flipping burgers at Whataburger. Right. All right, I'm going to go through this group chat uh, on the side here. I'm sorry, I wasn't able to see it as I was lecturing. There's a question, is one of these proven to be, or at least thought to be, better at preventing aspiration of gastric contents, blood, or other secretions? So that's, that's going back to the rescue airways. So <clears throat> the answer is a definite maybe. So let's talk about that. Absolute protection of the airway is obtained from an endotracheal tube, and it also prevents gastric contents from going into the trachea. However, eye gels, LMAs, and king tubes all have the possibility if a patient is semi-conscious to cause a gag reflex and aspiration of stomach contents into the trachea. LMA is probably the least protective. King tube and eye gels, in my opinion, are about the same. They seem to be about as protective. So keep in mind that most of the time they are rescue efforts because you've already tried intubation and missed. So they're usually there as a backup if you've already paralyzed somebody. So their gag reflex is going to be a whole lot less. So you're going to have to treat them as, they, as if they were intubated while you have an airway in, uh, or at least a temporary airway, <clears throat> until you get them to the hospital. And in the bright lights in one of my trauma rooms, I can see even more. Someone said, I can answer that, only intubation is considered definitive, and that's correct. Next question, is the Eschmann catheter the same as a bougie? And the answer is yes. Uh, I use the Eschmann catheter. Uh, I call it Eschmann catheter because of my last name, Eschelbach. I didn't invent it. It just sticks easier for me. But a bougie is the same. Um, <clears throat> this one says pretty much, but it's shorter, but it... The answer is no, a bougie is the same, but uh, they're going to come in different lengths. Isn't the King and the King LT sometimes known to overinflate and compress nearby structures like the carotid artery? Well, that's a possibility, but um, that's why each one comes with a certain amount of air that is based on the size of the tube. You have to know exactly what size of the patient you're doing and um, put in the correct amount of air. So it's, it is, most of these tubes come in a kit and the kit has the correct size of, of air that goes by. <clears throat> it is possible to compress the carotid artery, but I think you'd have to put a whole hunkin' extra bit of air in there. Um, let me see, someone says, Gary says, understood, but one of these rescue devices is better than another, mostly just based on the price or protocol. Uh, why would one choose one over another? Well, <clears throat> let me tell you a, a little bit about equipment. I write protocols for all of my agencies. As I said, our area includes probably about a third of the state of Oregon and all the paramedics 
uh, follow those protocols. Some agencies are unincorporated. I lectured last night at an agency that doesn't really have a very high tax base. So they're not able to pay for a fancy um, Braslow tape system and they use a simple wheel. So everything is going to be different regional. Some places, if you work in a city, they're going to have everything available to them. Some places are going to have a budget and they might go with the cheaper. Cheaper is not always better. Um, yes, an LMA is best used on somebody with an empty stomach uh, in a surgical environment uh, because the course is that, that not that snug. And I, I said that probably of the three rescue devices, it's probably the least. All right. Uh, we talked about ETOH and refusal. Is there a difference between a person who had a beer or a glass of wine with dinner and a person who's been binge drinking since noon? Boy, that's really a hard one. Um, <laughs> that's a lawyer question. Uh, so a person who had a drink or a beer, they still have the capacity to make decisions and they're still of sound mind and body. That's a little bit different than somebody who's grossly intoxicated. Uh, you also have the duty to terrify. And if you think that somebody's injuries, if they've only had one glass of wine or two, if you think that their injuries and they're, are severe enough, you still have that duty to terrify. And then if you're not sure, call PD to help you. Somebody might change their mind pretty quickly if police show up and they've been driving and now they're injured. They might want to go to the hospital to get away from the police. That, that's all I can guess. <clears throat> yeah, if somebody smells of E2H, that's, it, it's difficult. Um, some people carry breathalyzers. Some agencies, I've seen them do that. I don't have that in my protocols. I just want, this doesn't happen as much as you think, thankfully. Uh, there are AMA refusals, but alcohol and refusal um, doesn't happen, thankfully, as much as you might think. Um, Here's a question, would it be better to use a pain medication like fentanyl pre-intubation instead of lidocaine to blunt the pain response? Oh, uh, I'm sorry, that's a, very, uh, that's a very specific question. You use lidocaine, particularly in head injuries because it has the ability to decrease intracerebral pressure. It also, just like when you go to the doctor and it numbs your tooth, lidocaine numbs the gag response. There is some recent literature that says you don't need to use lidocaine. So it's out there as a possibility. Fentanyl is part of the pain response. It's also part of the sedation that we need to give to treat those people. So many of your RSI protocols may have a narcotic hook to them as well. Most of the time you want to cause some type of disassociation. That's why I prefer ketamine. Uh, question after Gary's question above, if a minor is a parent, all right, do they make legal decisions for their child even if it's against medical advice? Man, <clears throat> you guys are thinking too hard. So if a minor, uh, what I'm reading into this question is, if you're less than 18 years old and you're a parent, can you make decisions for your child? And the answer is yes, because you're emancipated. Now, even if it's against medical advice, well, then you use your best judgment. And if you have to, you're gonna to to use the implied consent law and get PD involved. It's a very difficult question. And um, not one within the confines of our discussion today. That's a whole nother legal and ethical question. Uh, when it used, to, here's the next question. Uh, when it comes to using ketamine, do you always follow it up with Versed? Uh, I do personally, particularly in children, because ketamine, when people come out of uh, ketamine, what it does is it's a disassociative anesthetic. Ketamine kind of 
blocks the brain and chops it off from the rest of the body. I use it a lot for painful procedures like reducing uh, fractures and things because people don't remember what's going on and they can't fight me. They don't have the conscious ability to fight me. They still experience pain. So if I'm doing a painful procedure, I give them a pain medication. And then I give them the Versed, like it says here, because Versed is an amnestic. It causes amnesia. So people won't remember. So the best way to go is if you use ketamine, also to give them a little bit of midazolam or Versed, because it helps the brain forget. And there have been some instances, believe it or not, in the literature and in legal precedent where people have been sued because even though you saved their life, they remembered the whole thing and they have now post-traumatic stress disorder and that's your fault, even though you saved their life. Go figure. All right, is that everything? I see no more questions. Wow, that was wonderful. Good questions, guys. All right, you're welcome. Dr. Frame will be here unless something uh, changes. I believe, guys, the first Friday evening of November. I'll right. post on the... Dr. Eschelbach, when will you decide you'd like to come back? Uh, I, let me add, um, my November schedule should be out shortly, and I'll send you an email. I have a question. Could everybody see? Thank you for all the thank yous. Uh, could everybody hear that little video clip? All right. Yeah. All right. Good. good. It didn't offend anybody because that's my humor. That's my style. Good. Thanks. Okay. No offense. Good. All right. <laughs> good. All right. All good. All right. I got to remember, sometimes I got to remember boundaries, you know, uh, that's it. All right, thank uh, you everybody, folks. Uh, Jane, you, I'll give everybody your credit. Good night. All right, good night.